Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing insulin synthesis and secretion. Okay, so we're currently in the process of looking at how an increase in the level of adenosine triphosphate within the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans is going to lead to the release of the secretory vesicles which contain uh, the insulin and uh, C-peptide. Okay, so, to, in order to understand this, we need to understand the ATP-sensitive potassium channels, which are a member of the inward rectifying potassium channels. So, we are therefore uh, having a little sidetrack where we study the inward the rectifying potassium channels. Okay, so we've discussed that they are a tetramer, they're made up of uh, four separate subunits, and that the membrane-spanning topologies of these subunits looks like so. We've also discussed the reason that they are considered inwardly rectifying, i.e. that they prefer the movement of potassium in uh, to the movement of potassium out. Okay, right, so now I want to talk about uh, the uh, diversity in the subunits of the inwardly rectifying potassium channels. So what would be beautifully simple is if there was just one gene which was called the inwardly rectifying potassium channel gene and this made this protein here and this was the only one and you stuck four of them together and there we have our inwardly rectifying potassium channel. It's not that simple unfortunately. Instead, there are 15 genes which all code for proteins that look like this and can form a quarter of an inwardly rectifying potassium channel. Okay, so what we have done to try and make this understandable is we have put them into seven different families, basically. So there are seven families of the genes. So there is the KIR, so in with the rectifying potassium channel, one family. There is the KIR2 family. There is the KIR3 family. There is the KIR4 family. There is the KIR5 family. There is the KIR6 family. And finally, there is the KIR7 family. So these are the seven families uh, into which we group uh, the genes that code for inwardly rectifying potassium channel subunits. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, let's start off with how many genes are within each family. So in the KIR1 family, there is only one gene within that family, and this gene is known as the KIR1.1 gene. Okay, in the KIR2 family, uh, there are four genes in that family. So there is the KIR2.1, there is the KIR2.2 gene, there is the KIR2.3 gene, and finally there is the KIR2.4 gene. Okay, so there's all of the genes in the KIR2 family. Uh, next, in the KIR3 family, again, there are three, sorry, there are four members of this. So it's KIR3.1, KIR3.2, KIR3.3, and then finally, uh, KIR3.4. Okay, uh, in the KIR4 family, there are two members of that family. Uh, there is the KIR 4.1, and you hopefully are getting the idea that they're all named very sensibly. Okay, then there is the KIR 4.2 member. Okay, in the KIR 5 family, there's only one member, KIR 5.1. Okay, in the KIR 6 family, which is going to be very important to us because this is the uh, ATP sensitive potassium channel family. There is the KIR 6.1 gene, and there is also the KIR 6.2 gene. And then finally, in the KIR 7 family, there's just one member, which is KIR 7.1. Okay, now, uh, basically, we've got these 15 genes here. Let's just check that I've drawn out 15. So there's 10 here, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that's good. Okay. Uh, basically, what you can do is you can assemble these into homotetramers and also heterotetramers. So basically, we have seen that there are these 15 different genes and that these all code for proteins that have a membrane-spanning topology like so. Okay, so they look like this when they actually uh, are produced. 
Okay, and what is then going to happen is these uh, subunits are then going to assemble into a tetramer. So you're going to get four of these and you're going to assemble them into a tetramer. So there are two options, therefore. You can either take four identical proteins. So you can pick one of these 15 and you'll say, okay, I'm going to use this protein four times. Okay, I'm going to make four copies of this same protein, stick them together and make a inwardly rectifying potassium channel. Okay, that would be called a homo tetramer. Homo meaning same. Okay, so this is a tetramer made up of uh, four identical subunits, basically, and that's why it's called same tetramer. Okay, however, you can also produce what are known as heterotetramers. So hetero means different, and then tetramer. So this means that we are going to be building these tetrameric complexes out of different uh, subunits, basically. So we're going to be mixing and matching. However, before you get scared about the diversity that is possible there, uh, there are rules. Okay, so if you want to make a heterotetramer, it's not just a case of you can pick whichever four genes you want. No. Uh, basically, you pick two. At the most, you pick two, basically. So you might pick the KIR 3.1, for instance. So you might pick one of them as the KIR 3.1 here, maybe. And then you pick another one, and generally the other one which you pick has to be in the same family. So generally you might have to pick, let's say, KIR 3.2, so you have to stay within the same family. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it is a rule that uh, works reasonably well. Okay, so then you've got your two here, and what you'll do is you'll produce some KIR 3.1s and some KIR 3.2 proteins, and obviously the number you produce will have to add up to four, and then you can stick those together to make a tetramer. Okay, so it's not just a matter of picking whichever ones you want. You only find heterotetramers, which are a mixture of two different types of subunits. You don't find them that are a mixture of three or four different types of subunits. Okay, so to illustrate this even more, basically heterotetramers which you find, you find uh, a KIR 3.1, KIR 3.2 tetramer, as I've just uh, talked about. You also find the KIR 3.1 in a tetramer uh, with KIR 3.3. Okay, so KIR 3.1 with KIR 3.3. You also find a tetramer of KIR 3.1 with KIR 3.4. So all possible heterotetramers where you have KIR 3.1 mixed with any one of the other uh, three members of the KIR 3 family, they are found, basically. And the same is true for the KIR 2 family. So basically, you can find uh, KIR 2.1 heterotetramized with any one of the other three. So you can either pick KIR 2.2, KIR 2.3, and KIR 2.4 and put it here. Okay, so I'll put KIR 2.x, where x can either be 2, 3, or 4. So it's exactly analogous to here, where instead of KIR 3.1, you replace that with KIR 2.1, and again, you replace these with. 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4. Okay, so those are the sort of heterotetramers you can make. However, there is uh, one break, well, a good example to the break in the rule that you always make heterotetramers within the same family is that uh, you have a tetramer of KIR 4.1 with KIR 5.1. So this is a heterotetramer where you've got two subunits involved in this heterotetramer that are not in the same family, and that's the sort of archetypal example of an inwardly rectifying heterotetramer where the two uh, subunits, the two different types of subunits, are not in the same family. Okay, so it's not a rule that always holds true. Now, basically, if you make an inwardly rectifying potassium channel out of subunits that are either in the KIR1, the KIR4, the KIR5, or the KIR7 family, then those are known as potassium transport channels. So basically, if you use this family, uh, this family, this family, or this family, 
the green ones, these uh, the inwardly rectifying potassium channels that you produce out of subunits in these four families are then known as potassium transport channels. Okay, so all of these green um, families, if you use their subunits that are in those families to produce inwardly rectifying potassium channels, whether they're homotetramers or heterotetramers, then your potassium channel is known as a potassium transport channel. Okay, so I'll highlight this in green. Okay, now, if you use members of the KIR2 family, okay, and I'll highlight this in orange, if you use members of that family to make a um, inwardly rectifying potassium channel, then your inwardly rectifying potassium channel is known as a classical inwardly rectifying potassium channel. So classical in with the rectifying potassium channel, which I'll just abbreviate to KIR channel. Okay, so that's the sort of uh, less formal name for um, in with the rectifying potassium channels built out of uh, KIR2 family members. Okay, uh, then for the KIR3 family, okay, this family if you use members of this family to build an inwardly rectifying potassium channel, then that inwardly rectifying potassium channel is known as a G-protein uh, gated potassium channel for obvious functional reasons. Okay, so they are often opened by G-protein mechanisms. So G-protein gated potassium channel. Okay, so I'll colour these ones in in pink. So. The KIR3 family is the G-protein gated potassium channel family. Okay, and then finally, KIR6 is the star of the show. This is the reason we've discussed these in with the rectifying potassium channels, to discuss KIR6. So if you make a in with the rectifying potassium channel out of the members of the KIR6 family, then it is known as an ATP sensitive um, potassium channel. Okay, and for short, ATP-sensitive potassium channel is often abbreviated just KATP. So that this was often written just as KATP. Okay, so I'll highlight this then in turquoise. Okay, and it's these ATP-sensitive potassium channels that we will, from now on, be concerning our attention on. Okay, so I'll continue this discussion in the next video.